I'm the strong one. I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. I move mountains. I move mountains. I move churches. churches. And I glow because I know what my worth is. is. Oh my god, so many good lines in that song. You know how I've been starting my day every morning, Jeff? By throwing a bunch of donkeys in a church around? Um, not exactly, but close. So uh-huh. I have my Amazon thing set up for um You almost said it, didn't you? I did. Um for it I say good morning to it and then it plays the news and the weather, and then every other time every time after that I say Play Encanto soundtrack, and then I listen through the full Encanto soundtrack every single morning while I'm getting ready to go for a run. Welcome to Into the Fold, a show where two best friends share their love of Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse chapter by chapter. I'm Jeff. And I'm Juliana, and this week we are talking about Siege and Storm, chapters 5 and 6. Yay! Welcome back, listeners! There is a big chapter, and there's a little chapter. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I had chapter five, which is great because I love the characters that are in it. But as you know, Jeff, I sent you a voice message being like, how freaking long is this chapter? Good Lord. I've been listening to it for like 45 minutes and it's not over yet. No. And see, that's why we talked about listening to podcasts at just a little bit above uh, regular speed. I do the same thing with audiobooks. I think... If it's a book I really, really love and I really want to make it last as long as possible, it's something like 1.2 times speed. But like, for example, I recently uh, finished one of the Song of Ice and Fire novels, the Game of Thrones novels, and that book was, it would have taken 37 hours to listen to that whole book if I had just kept it at normal speed. So I put it at like 1.6 because not only is it a long book, that narrator, he reads so slowly. So I put this thing at 1.6 times speed and it feels like normal conversation. I feel like that says a lot. Yeah. See, I can't do that when I'm taking notes, though. That's the only problem. No, because you have to constantly stop, don't you? Yeah, I have to listen to it at the regular speed. Plus, I'm like stopping every five seconds to like take a note or whatever. So, yeah. So it, it's kind of long, but these are really fun chapters, I would say. I definitely, any chapter that has, um, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong multiple times, so listeners just strap on in. Sturmhon, Sturmhound, Stremhound, Strembond, whatever, Stromboli. however. Stromboli. Stromboli, whatever I end up calling him. He's, a, he's very prominent in these chapters, and I love him. We've already established that. So I'm definitely down for more chapters with Sturmhon in them. You know, the more I think about it, the more I think this Sturmhound thing could actually catch on. Uh, I'm kind of coming around to it now. I mean, why not? They all howl anyway, and they act like they're dogs, and there's a wolf on the flag anyway, so... It... Is there a wolf on the flag? I'm pretty sure there's a wolf on there the flag. There is a wolf on the... Well, yeah, because, duh, obviously they wouldn't be flying, like, say, the Lansoff Eagle, because they're privateers, not pirates. Jeff, before we get into the discussion today, I think we have some lovely... News from the front. Woo! News! News. Okay, so Jeff, we actually don't have that much actual news, except for the fact that the cast is filming, and we are getting little bits and pieces of them filming, but it's nothing really to talk about. It's more just them sitting behind the scenes, chilling as buds. You know what? I will happily look at them. I will look at them sitting at a bus stop yeah, in Budapest you. because, first of all, Budapest is beautiful. Yeah. They should call it Budapest because it looks like it. <laughs> also, I would look at them sitting at a bus stop anywhere. I would look at them sitting on upturned buckets at a construction site in Newark because they are beautiful people. Okay, if anything, that sounds like a Vogue shoot right there. That doesn't even sound like it's like a crappy place. That sounds like somewhere Vogue would intentionally take people to take pictures. 
Oh, yeah, like they would get them all dressed up and they'd get them in full hair and makeup and costumes and mm-hmm. looking absolutely glamorous, but then they would shoot them in like an industrial space because it's like, oh, it's opposites. The it's juxtaposition contrast. of whatever. Yeah, it's like, that's what makes it fun. Yeah, these people make $15 an hour, but I'm wearing a $30,000 outfit. Oh, isn't that funny? Yeah, it's like you 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 put them in Versace, but then you shoot it in front of people who look like they pronounce it Versace. I think a great spot to do one of those would be like a really just rundown, frequently used porta potty. That's a good contrast for a really high off like high octane Versailles suit. You think? Yeah, but the pictures would turn out all crappy. Ayo, because it's a porta potty. Oh. Ah. Oh, I am full of the dickens today. Actually, wow. I am full of the dickens and pain in my thighs because of the 12 miles that I ran yesterday. Oh, God, yeah. I know my hips hurt from this morning. Something was funky happening, but it's okay. Probably because I just haven't run outside much recently, and I just ran outside. And it's, it's windy and hills, and my body was not used to running on the hills because it's been a week of running inside, so... Were they at least alive with the sound of music? The sound of wind. Lots that of wind. That can be musical. I mean, there's wood winds. Mm. I personally did not have any like open glasses or bottles to create wind music out of or just clarinets that I was running with. But, you know, maybe next time I'll hold a clarinet or a flute and I'll really just make music as I'm running along. If you do that, please... Please, video, or it didn't happen. I mean, honestly, if I could get my hands on a flute and someone wanted to videotape me running with a flute, I totally would do that. I will bring you a flute. I'll run with any woodwind instrument. I will bring you a flute. You know what? I will bring you a flute. I will shoot the video, and then we will put that on all the socials. You got it. I'll wear whatever costume you want to, as long as my, as long as I'm not exposed. Noise. So Lee Bardugo is going to visit the cast who are filming in Budapest, which looks beautiful. The cast is beautiful, and I'm sure season two will be absolutely beautiful. Yes, and we're waiting on a release date on that. So listeners, as soon as we know when the next season will be premiering on Netflix, we will be sure to let you know immediately or if we have any other announcements for the show or any other books that Lee is putting out, like Ninth House number two, which should be coming out in the next year or two, hopefully. So stay tuned for any information like that. In our other segment of the news, we have the voice of the people. Our podcast question last week was, do you agree or disagree with Jenya's decision to stay with the Darkling? Just to recap, this is the moment where Jenya decides to stay behind and let the Nichivoya swarm her while Alina and the others get away does not escape with her friend mm-hmm. so we actually, i know it was sad it was we a actually bit got sad, a, yeah. we actually got a lot of responses from people this week which is really exciting so thank you listeners and to anyone who responded to the question jeff what was our first answer it's something that came from when we put out our podcast questions on our social medias we also put them up as a survey on spotify mm-hmm. and it's the first time somebody has answered that. So somebody named Terry on Spotify just said no. And that's all. Capital N, little O, no. Terry, we respect your answer. Thank you for I your I respect feedback. your answer, Terry. Thanks Thank for that. Thank you for your feedback. Not but... sure at all what this means. And yet this word no is, is beautiful to me. It's I like definitive. it. definitive. We like it. We like someone who has a definitive opinion and sticks to their guns. So thank you, Terry, for that. We also did a, get a bunch of other awesome responses. Our first longer form response is from our friend Mel, not Mal. And they said, obviously, it's not a good choice. But from her perspective, it makes sense. She stays with what she knows and what she believes will keep her safe to, quote, throw away, unquote, your entire life even if it sucks for the most part, is a huge deal, and she's not ready for that yet and is too scared to go for it. One does not simply run away from the Darkling either. You better give that a good thought and make a, a good plan, You're or you're dead in a second, unless you're Alina, of course. 
<laughs> that last Bella. part is she just brings it home and she says, I mean, Alina is the exception. But that's kind yeah. of one of the themes of the book. Alina is the exception to a lot of things. And that's why the, these couple of books are kind of from her perspective. Yeah, I mean, Alina's big underlying question is kind of who am I? What is my purpose, per se? And she's definitely an individual on a lot of platforms. But Jenya, again, is to it an individual, but she, like Mel said, has spent her whole life with the Darkling and probably doesn't have the drive and wherewithal to escape him um, or the resources either. People seem to just jump in behind Alina a lot. And she's also got Mal, who is just like a giant wall of no thoughts, but all buffness. Oh, he's got thoughts. <laughs> They're not worth talking about, though. They're... <laughs> and yet we're going to talk about them. Yeah, I know, unfortunately. Uh... Mel has a good point, though, because it brings to mind that there are some decisions you can make as snap decisions, like you decide at the moment how you feel about it, but then there are some decisions, like major life-altering decisions, like where mm -hmm. your loyalties are that you have to take time over. And she's being expected to make a big life-altering decision in the moment. And I think anybody would probably find that difficult at least yeah i feel like a lot of our other answers that we're gonna read were kind of along those lines too i know i'm gonna skip down to this one jeff kaylin said jenga has no idea what will happen to her if she goes with stormhound ha 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 at least she knows the rough idea of what will happen in the future with the darkling i mean is that really a positive i mean she knows what her future with the darkling will be like it will be sad Terrible. Yeah, and she's she's trying to she knows what she wants. She certainly does know what she wants the future to be like under the Darkling. And she's still clinging to that idea that things are going to be OK for her people. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the Grisha at this point in the books are clinging to that fantasy of that. The Darkling really isn't as terrible as we kind of think he is. And he actually is looking out for the Grisha and the better of the Ravkin people. But we might find out, Jeff, that that is not quite the case. What a surprise. That's a good possibility. Yeah. Listeners, stay tuned. Is the Darkling a bad person? I don't know. I feel like there is ample proof that he is, but I mean, there's a lot of books for us to get through. Yeah. I mean, when you go into a court case, Jeff, you want to have as much evidence as physically possible. So that when we fully condemn the Darkling, we want to have all the receipts. Oh, oh, do you? Is that how court cases work? Yeah, I bring in my Starbucks receipt. I bring in my grocery store receipt. I bring in my receipt for my gas that I just bought. And then I say, look at all the receipts. Are you sure you weren't going to H&R Block? It sounds like you were going to H&R Block. <sighs> you know... Tax people, court, they're all kind of in the same realm of evil. Aren't they, though? I think that it doesn't matter. I could be no. at a courthouse, I could be at an H&R block. You wouldn't know the difference. Either way, somebody bangs a gavel and then you either get money or you lose money. Mm-hmm. Very valid. Moving on! <laughs> so our next response comes from Messy Vanessi. Love saying that. And she says, I feel so much for Jenya, and this decision, while difficult from our perspective, was probably easy for her. She's had a pretty rough time of it, and all that's kept her going was the belief that things would be better when the Darkling's great plan comes to fruition. To walk away from that would probably feel like accepting her suffering was for nothing more than other people's gain. Balancing the decision... The, balancing the decision between the grain of hope that she has left in the Darkling's plan and her very new friendship with Alina, I don't think she would have had to give it a second thought. Yeah. So that's a little bit different. Yeah, but they're all kind of playing on the same thing of that Jenya is not really inclined to leave the Darkling because it's really all she's known at this point, and change is scary, and she doesn't really have the I feel like she just doesn't have the people behind her essentially that she knows that she can trust to make this giant risk and giant leap because she's the one who went behind Alina's back and kind of ruined that friendship if she hadn't done that then I could see the connection she had with Alina being enough for her to go with her in that moment but because she has kind of low key on her end as far as she can tell burned that bridge it's definitely mm -hmm. a lot more of a 
bigger risk for her to just take that jump. True. And sometimes in friendship dynamics, it can feel a little bit like there's the alpha friend, the one who makes the decisions, the one Mm -hmm. who ultimately knows what's best, the one who's in charge. And then there's the kind of beta or omega who is the one that's always following and taking cues from the alpha friend. I think it's possible that because Jenya has existed in this realm of Grisha so much more and in a different way than Alina has, then maybe she sees herself as the one who knows what's best here. Because if you think back on all the interactions that they've had, Mm -hmm. especially the ones that they've had on the ship together, it's pretty clear that Jenya was trying to control certain aspects of their friendship because she thought she knew what was best, but Alina never did that to Jenya until trying to convince her to get on this ship and come away with them. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. And I feel like this is kind of a shift in the dynamics a little bit too. And Jenya, that would make Jenya question things even more in this moment too, with this shifting dynamic and also that a dynamic that they had previously, you know? That's a fascinating layer because hmm. Je- that would mean that whether consciously or not, Jenya is trying to control something, which I get the yeah. feeling she's never had the chance to do her whole life. Probably not, no. Like she's never steered the ship, but here is her chance to make an important decision that feels like it's actually her decision. Yeah, so she's relishing in that power a little bit. Mm, relishing in the power and also uh, being a hot dog with relish on it for the Nietzsche Voya because they're kind of turning her into an actual snack. Tasty. Mm. <laughs> okay. What else do we have? We got a response from our friend Marjolaine, and she said, she can't run from the darkling, darkling yet. It's painful because as a reader and in Alina's mind, you know that's because of the toxic hold that he has on her life, which pretty much lines up with what we've already just talked about, Jeff. Yeah, she's right. Mm-hmm. So I think Marjolaine might think that there's going to be a different, hopefully better moment for Jenya to break away. Let's just hope that she doesn't get damaged too much further while we're waiting for that moment to arrive. Mm-hmm. And we also got a response from our friend Nicole, who said, Jenga's decision to stay with the Darkly makes sense if you think about how long she was used and abused, and not even thought of as Grisha by the other Grisha. As evil as the Darkling is, to her, he is the person who got her out of her miserable situation. She probably feels loyalty for that, but it's just another person. So I understand, but I wish she would have had the courage to choose the right side and choose her friend Alina. I do too. Yeah. At the same time, th- th- in this book, we see that Lee Bardugo is really maturing as a writer. And one of the things mm-hmm. that you do as you mature as a writer is you have to make difficult decisions about what's going to happen to the characters that you love sometimes. Yeah. Which is why I would love to one day to ask Lee Bardugo if she considers it more difficult to let bad things happen to good characters or good things happen to bad characters. Because... We see a little bit of both of those things. One day I will get to ask her that. I don't know how, but I'm manifesting it is going to happen. Jeff, if you know anything about me, I am relentless at getting people on podcasts. So we're going to make it happen. Don't you worry. I I have faith in you. Oh, thanks. I believe in you. Um, yeah, that's that. You know what, listeners? Let's make that our 2022 goal. We're going to have maybe not in 22, but we're going to like get closer to having, if not have, Lee Bardugo on this podcast. Let's oh, let's yeah. let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Help us out, manifest it. Think about it. Put it on your little prayer altar. Whatever you do, we need make your it happen. energy to make a spirit bomb. Yeah, we love spirit bombs. And Jeff, who was our last answer from? Well, we got a lovely long email from our dear listener, Canadian Peyton. They said they were okay with us calling them that. Yeah. We got an email from Canadian Peyton. Love it. It's fun. So in response to the question, Canadian Peyton said, I think that Jenya was right to stay with the Darkling. Gasp! Controversy! (gasps) Jenya grew up in a war-ridden country, and she herself is a spy to her leader. To ask her to run away from all that she's known, even if it may be the right decision, would be asking her to turn her back on her country, her leader, and her comrades in the blink of an eye, and turn her back on the cause she's been fighting for her whole life. I also feel that this is the case for many Grisha who are loyal to the Darkling as well after his coup. 
it is safer for them to follow familiarity and order that has existed for decades than to join a rebellion that has erupted in the past few months. So this does a great job of connecting her not only this this takes not just her own decisions into account but it connects her to the other Grisha and it mm-hmm. kind of reminds you that she's probably not the only one who's grappling with these feelings. She's the one we're talking about because she's the one who made friends with Alina and had all those fun slumber parties at the little palace. Yeah. But yeah, she's definitely not the only Grisha who's in this situation either. And we see the other Grisha who are part of the Darklings cavalcade on the ship and they can't all be like just bad people, you know? They just seem to be the product of a terrible leader. He's a cult leader. Yeah. Let's get this right. Yeah. He is a cult leader. Mm -hmm. He is a megalomaniac. He is like Charles Manson with an army. Welcome to the Church of the Dark. I'm sure there There has to be be. a Sunday. There's a Sunday service, a tele, tele church, whatever the heck it's called, service of the Darkling. Probably. They probably have it at, like, dusk every night. Mm. Just imagine, like, a Grisha choir in their keftas in this Just little chapel. Grande. And, yeah, they're, like, doing a gospel version of, This is the part where I say I don't want to be stronger than I've been, been before. before. This is the part oh, where, where I break free. free. But not really because the Darkling is our boss and nobody breaks free from him. That's mm-hmm. the subtext. Those aren't yeah. the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he, he's making them think like they're breaking free, you know? Oh, yeah. They're they're breaking free. Yeah. Like, not from the Darkling. Yeah, not though. from the Darkling. They're breaking free from everyone that isn't him because yeah. he's in charge. Exactly. Now, Canadian Peyton put more in that email we actually it's fine we split this into two parts we read the second part because it connected to the question but just to kind of round off our voice of the people segment here peyton also said hello my wonderful jeff and amazing juliana so you're amazing and i'm wonderful that is canon now yes They said, I do apologize for the radio silence over the past few weeks. I've been very busy with university applications and my classes. Also, I've been shoveling snow left, right, and center and don't want to lose an AirPod in the snow. I was utterly shocked and amazed when you read my email in an episode. I was in the gym getting swole and listening to the pod and I nearly dropped my weight when I got a shout out. Don't worry, I was 100% safe. Thank you so, so, so much. I have finished Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom now. Crooked Kingdom chapter 40 with like nine question marks. And I've started reading King of Scars. I'm not as invested as I was with the Shadow and Bone trilogy and the Six of Crows duology, but I have heard they are good, so I'm determined to continue. I'm super hyped for the second season of the show to come out, and once again, the casting has been done immaculately. Yes, it was so nice to hear from Canadian Peyton. So good. First of all, congratulations on your university applications and your classes. Education is very important. Mm -hmm. Second, good for you for going to the gym. I've been going to the gym as well because Juliana is helping me to train for a marathon in November. So I have not been getting swole, but I have been running rather a lot. Yes, you were getting fast and having good endurance, Jeff. Peyton is getting swole. I am getting swift. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. I love it. I would also just like to note that Canadian Peyton also sent us a picture of Canadian Bacon in their email. They did. I love it. Yeah. It's lovely. It's fun. I'm a vegetarian myself, but I appreciate images of food that looks good. It looks good. Yes. And uh, just, just to uh, say what I said before and in your email, Canadian Peyton, send us a picture of your face cropped onto this Canadian bacon picture so I may have proper Canadian Peyton. Thank you very much. Our email is open at all times. I do agree with what Peyton says about the King of Scars duology being a teensy bit dry compared to the others. But you know what? Yeah. Honestly... All I'm going to say is when you create a universe this big and this amazing and it becomes a part of you the way it's become a part of us and then you bring it to a close, there's going to be a lot. And that's all I'm going to say. There's going to be a lot. 
And I'm going to say I'm hoping that that universe is not brought to a close and that this is an unfinished story at the end of those books. But that is just my request to Lee Bardugo. <music> Jeff, what we came here to do today is the holy ceremony of reading chapters five and six. Do you, Jeffrey Hutton, take chapter six to be your lawfully wedded chapter? I do. And do you, chapter six, take Jeffrey Hutton to be your law... Hef, 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 Hutton. Oh, why can't I say your last name? I to don't be, know. To be your lawfully wedded podcast host. I do! I now pronounce you podcast host and chapter. You may flip the page. Flip. Wow, that was so ceremonious. <laughs> okay, listeners, so as we said, we are going to be reading chapters five and six today from uh, Siege and Storm. And if you haven't read the chapters yet and you don't want to be spoiled, please stop here and go back and read them. If not, and you don't care, we're providing summaries for the chapters anyway. So let's forge ahead, shall we, Jeff? Yes, and I think that you should summarize chapter five because it features quite a lot of your favorite boy. So how about you You get us into it? My boy. So listeners, just for reference, like we said at the top of the episode, this is a long chapter. So this summary is a little bit longer than the ones we normally have just because there's a lot that happens in this, in this chapter. So in chapter five, Sturmhound's ship gets away and they have the Sea Whip in tow. Alina is to kill the Sea Whip, but she doesn't want to, so Mal has to help her and she feels guilty the entire time. After the crew takes all the Sea Whip skills they can to fill their empty pockets, Sturmhound sits back for a short moment to admire the real prize for the day's adventure. Alina! Is money his motivation for this or just insanity? If anything, we learn Sturmhound had sticky fingers and one sassy, brassy, in your ass attitude those sticky fingers have grabbed him what the darkling has been reading the lives of saints which oddly has pictures of the stag and sea whip and in it and hmm what is this last thing but nevertheless we need to keep moving and move towards os crov what was it os crovos of os carbo os carbo where sturmhound's client is mal and alina want their check please and to leave the seafood restaurant asap but sturmhan has a deal for them meet his client and hear them out alina reluctantly agrees with mal's encouragement time for tamar and alina sleepover mal isn't happy with the sleeping arrangements though <laughs> alina and sturmhan then squabble as the ship gets ready to get going as we sail away alina wonders why the darkling wanted her to have the skills or risk having another amplifier Maybe the answer is in this book. Is it only one-to-one -one for amplifiers? But why? This is a big question. And Alina and Sturmon have a nice brainstorm session about that, along with topics such as the Darkling, country loyalty, freedom, having autonomy, and other light topics like that. Sturmon ends the conversation by promising Alina her freedom no matter what. Tamar brings Alina to their cabin, and Alina soaks in the old ship aesthetic. It's for the gram, you know. Tamar impacts all her weapons, and we mean all of her weapons. And we learn that Tamar is a Grisha, along with being the world's coolest badass ever. Alina and Mal get a food upgrade. Mal and Sturmhound bond over weapons, and Alina thinks about what she'll do with the scales. Alina feels like Sturmhound looks off to her, but she has bigger things to address right now. Alina shows Mal what she saw in the Lives of Saints, and they have one more amplifier to find now. And that is pretty much what happens in the chapter. Like we said, this is a long chapter and a lot of things happened. Huh. Oh, oh, sorry. I uh, feel like I was asleep for 100 years. What year is it? Uh, currently, it is 2076. You are another 50 years older. Welcome to elderly stage. Well, that explains why my legs hurt. Yeah. Hang on, I'm going to I'm going to pull my I'm going to pull my uh jeans all the way up to my to my chest and I'm going to go outside and tell some kids to get off my lawn. You know, I since you've been gone so long, Jeff, I can now instant Amazon order you things. So I just pressed a button and there should be a pack of suspenders sitting directly next to you right now. See, you're joking, I could tell, but uh, based on my last Ring uh doorbell camera update, I think there actually is a porch on there's a porch on my porch. Yeah. There's a package on my porch right now. <laughs> Could it be suspenders? I don't know. 
I don't know. I get so many packages now, I don't even know what I've bought. But let's talk about this incredibly long chapter where so many things happen. Yeah. Dermhand is demonstrating his incredible leadership skills of this chapter because when the Darkling gives orders, it feels like he's always saying or else at the mm -hmm. end, even if he doesn't use those words. But when he gives orders, he gives orders that don't sound like threats. He checks on his crew to see how they're doing. When they gather and discuss the fact that a bunch of good people died on this mission they just did, they say a prayer together. You think the Darkling does any of that? No. To me, no. To me, it feels like, and it presents that Sturmhan thinks and acts as part of the actual crew. Like, you see him in the action of the fight. You see him giving orders, but also fighting at the same level as the other people on his crew. And to me, and probably to literally everyone else that's ever existed, Sturmhand is much more human than the Darkling is, because as we said before, the Darkling is very inhuman. And he definitely translates that into his dictator leadership style. Well, Sturmhand is a person clearly of great ability and capacity, and he has lived long enough to become a mature person who's capable of being in charge, but he hasn't lived so long with such incredible power that he's completely lost his humanity, which is, I think, part of the Darkling's problem. Yeah, the Darkling has just lost his sense of connection to what it feels like to have the probability that you could die. Yes. That is absolutely so. And Sturmhan still has that little, though it's not big in his soul, that little inkling in his soul that he is not immortal. And the Darkling no. is like, eh, f*** it. I'm not going to die. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> he says, why should I bother being nice to people? I'm going to live forever and they're all going to die. It's not worth my effort. No, whereas Stormhunt says, well, you know what? I'm only going to live for so long, so I might as well go out in a blaze of glory and leave a sexy corpse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds about right to me. I like it. I mean, catching the sea whip would have been a blaze of glory because this sea whip... It, gorgeous. Is sea whip absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful scales, I'm sure. And when you think about it compared to the stag, like, they caught the stag after tracking it for some time, the mm -hmm. sea whip they caught in a couple of days. And yeah. the stag was shot on sight by one person, but it took a whole crew to bring in the sea whip. And what's interesting is, I don't remember there being a tragic backstory for the stag. It supposedly grants wishes for its captor, whereas the sea whip, the scales have power, but it comes with a tragic backstory about how it got the way it is. Yeah, which is something that we talked about in our last episode. So listeners, if you want that, you can go and listen to episode 18 of this podcast. But yeah, I agree with you, Jeff. It feels as though we should kind of think as these of these amplifiers as being on the same playing field. But when you break it down, they're kind of not. No, they're very different. Like a lot of things about them are different. Yeah, it's just kind of weird to me because... The stag seems hard to find but easy to kill, and the sea whip seemed easy to find but hard to kill. Ooh, that is a brilliant option. I didn't even think of that. I'm, That's I, my good. brain is the cogs of my brain are constantly churning, Jeff. There is just ice cream being made at all points up here. Churn, 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 churn. No. One thing that they do have in common, though, and I was I was thinking about this recently. Do you think that, like, I know we bring up Harry Potter all the time on here, and you know what? Dang yeah. it, here it goes again. I don't care. If people take issue with it, don't at me. We know a lot about it, and I think that they compare. But you remember when Dumbledore put the Sorcerer's Stone in the mirror, and he mm -hmm. said that only somebody who could find it but not want to use it would be able to get it? I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, the Sea Whip seems very that to me. Well, not just the sea whip, but the these legendary amplifiers as well, and the fact that Alina is able to wield more than one. Do you yeah. think that the fact that she is able to wield them has anything to do with the fact that she's not seeking power 
for herself. She's not trying to increase her own strength so that she can be a badass or dominate anybody the way the Darkling wants her to. Like, in her deepest nature, she just wants to be able to make everything okay. Yeah, I definitely think that that's a huge part of why she is this chosen one, quote-unquote, and these Mm -hmm. amplifiers seem to be, and I have my suspicions why they're kind of drawn to her, but we're not going to talk about that because that's to come later on. Uh, I'll fully flesh that out as we go into the later books. But I have a feeling that these amplifiers are kind of at least low-key drawn to her from what we've seen because partially of that, and they just can sense that power and can also sense that morality that she has to not want to have them and have their power because of personal and selfish reasons. And also I think they can sense her level of empathy, which it seems to be kind of low key getting in the way for some of these things that they have and tasks that they have to achieve, which is nice to have that level of empathy, but at a certain point, Alina, you you got to realize that this is a life or death situation for you, my friend, and you can feel all those feelings, but they're not going to create a shield around you. Nope. Sorry. And this has come from one of the biggest empaths in the world, and I and you too, Jeff, like like empathy is a strength that's only going to take you so far. It's not going to it's not going to win a war for the most nope. part. Definitely Sorry. not. War war is one of the least empathetic actions that there is. I agree. And I wonder, though, about the power of the sea wi- a- a worthiness and all of that. The crew are stuffing their pockets with them, and they're going to sell them off individually, and they'll probably fetch a pretty good price because people buy what they think are the bones of dead saints. Yeah, but which is wild. I'm sure people will probably actually pay a good amount for these sea whip scales i'm wondering i I would would if somebody got a hold of enough of them to try to make an amplifier i'm wondering if they wouldn't be able to use them because they're not the one who took the power from the animal because that's the big thing with the amplifiers is you have to be the one who does the deed of killing or transferring their power to you so these people wouldn't be connected to the energy of the animal Probably wouldn't stop them from trying if they wanted to see if they could get that power badly enough, though. I mean, if you try hard enough for anything, Jeff, there's a slight possibility you could get it. Am I going to the Olympics for ski jumping? No. Could I try my hardest? Yes. Will I die? Probably. Uh Uh-huh. Will these people probably die trying if they try that hard? Uh Uh-huh. Me and these scale people are going to be in the same grave when I take up ski, ski jumping. Okay, so they can't make them into amplifiers. We're agreed on that. But they could probably still make them into jewelry. What if you set up like a little Etsy shop? Oh, I love that. you can make little sea whip bracelets. Oh my god, I would buy so many of these. I love things that are kind of like opal-esque. And this definitely is like very opal in the way that it shines like a rainbow and things like that. So I would would love that. Yeah, sign me up. Whoever's selling these on Etsy, I want one. I would wear one too. They can, we, we, we've already got our matching No Mourners, No Funerals sweatshirts that we're wearing that are available in our Etsy shop. Go over to Grisha Trading Post on Etsy and you can get your own. I will make it for you. And if you don't like what you see, I can make changes to the design because I'm making them myself. Yay. But you could make little sea wit bracelets. I think people would go for them. If I find the correct like bracelet uh gems or charms or beads i'm totally gonna make some bracelets but i i feel like i need the a very specific thing but let me brainstorm jeff let me brainstorm you know what's fun about alina that i realized in this chapter what is that she has this i don't know if she's doing this on purpose or not but she has this uncanny ability to reveal the true character of authority figures when she gets into a conversation with them. Because with the chief map maker at the beginning of the first book, he's a sexist pig. When she talks to the Darkling, he's a conceited manipulator. When he talks, when she talks to the Apparat, he's a complete and total creep. When she talks to Sturmhand, especially in this chapter, he is a cheeky master deflector. He does not like answering questions about himself. And I don't know if it's just because Alina is the one trying to get him to talk about himself the most, or if it's just this thing that she has where 
the true nature of all these male authority figures just really comes to the front when Alina is talking to them. See, this is where I feel like a pretty strong affinity with Alina because I feel like I put out those vibes a lot too. And I think honestly, it's just like a blunt naivete, like a blunt naivete and like a choice to not re- to treat these people like they're your equal, no matter how much power they technically have and just speak to them like you would speak to anyone else. Because as we mm-hmm. see going forward, even like Tamar and Tolia, they and Mal kind of is like also an exception, but they speak to him differently than Alina does. Alina treats him like she's just an, they're the exact same person. Like she is just talking to her friend and he and the other authority figures, I think get a little bit thrown off by that. And then she's able to kind of see through what they put up as an affect. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Makes sense. But Sturmhound definitely is cheeky and a master deflector. I like that about him. It yeah, me adds too. A, because it's not like he's being a jerk about it. Like, oh, I'm not going to tell you anything about me. You don't know me. You don't know me. I'm the captain of this ship. My neck goes back and forth a lot when I'm talking because you do not know anything about me. This is my head cannon now. When Sturmhan talks to Alina, even when he says like really moving things like, I lost 13 good men. Don't tell me it was all for nothing. Like his neck just never stops moving. He's like a sassy bobblehead. You know what? I can stand behind that. I like that. It's canon now. Yeah. Sturmhound the bobblehead. Funko? Funko, where are you? Where are our Funko Pops? For <laughs> They're probably standing by for official approval on the images of Sturmhound from the upcoming season two of Shadow and Bone. Or they're waiting for us to go online and custom design them ourselves. I know, honestly. I'm getting frustrated because we didn't get any for the first season and i'm really hoping we get some for the second season but that's just me okay but i think one of the things that sturmhan does good in his deflecting is he like you said isn't disrespectful or rude really he just kind of redirects everything alina says with a question so it's not like he's saying no directly but he is saying like why don't you where did you grow up well where did you come from and then he just listens to her answer and goes "Uh uh-huh and walks away (laughs) That reminds me that I have another um, Ron Swanson clip that I need to send you because it's oh, okay. gonna it's gonna have kind of Sturmhand energy to it. I think I'll send it to you when we're Ooh, done here. Okay, that sounds good. But Jeff, you have some required reading for us. Yes, there's a lot as they are really going hard on this Lives of Saints book. And you know what? I have a hard copy that Ashley and I read through. It has beautiful illustrations mm-hmm. in it. So I strongly recommend you add that to your collection. But I recommend that you also get the audiobook recording because all of the female saints in that book, the stories are narrated by the incredibly talented Lauren Fort Gang, who mm-hmm. does narration for a lot of the other books in the series. Yeah. And the male saints are narrated by Ben Barnes. See, I actually haven't listened to the audiobook of this yet. I have the actual physical book and I've read through it. And yes, I will confirm that the artwork is beautiful and you can actually see the image that they are referencing in this chapter. If you purchase that book, you can have proof that that exists. I suggest that you get both. Get the actual copy. Listen to the audiobook while you're looking at the actual book. Mm. I think that would be that would be a fun thing. Yeah. And then just real quick, I do want to shout out our friends over at Grisha Cast because they just started doing their discussion of the lives of saints. That just got started, so you've got plenty of time to catch up. Listen to them talk about that. It'll be a good chat. Yeah. So if you want that content immediately, head on over to our friends at Grisha Cast. If you're willing to wait a couple of years, stick around, you know? <laughs> Based on our current timetables, we will will be cashing in those 401ks and doing this podcast from rocking chairs. Yeah, which is, you know what? I'm fine with that, Jeff. That just means more time that you and I get to spend together talking about these books. So that's fine with me. True, but I'll be saying things like, I think you need to sit still because your rocking chair keeps picking up on the microphone. (laughs) 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 I would I would have a swivel chair. I need a swivel chair. That's what I need. Now, back to Sturmhand for a bit, because now we have yet another layer to the seven-layer dip of f***ery that's going on here, because he has a second 
client. The Darkling wasn't his only client, and he wants Alina to listen to what this other client has to say. And you know what? What if she says no? What if she's tired of the seven layer dip of fuckery going on in her life and people not being who they say they are and she says, you know what? No. Screw you, buddy. Drop us off at the next port and we'll be on our way. Is he gonna let her go? I don't he, think so. He, he kind of has her over a barrel here. I think the thing is too, and we'll get a little bit more of this in the next chapter too, she kind of likes being on his ship and... They just finished up their little, like, camping trip of hell and little excursion into town of hell. So even though she doesn't really want to dip her chip into the seven layer dip of f***ery, I think that it still is a tasty dip that she doesn't really want to get rid of quite yet. Because there are, as you said, multiple layers to this and... I feel as though if I were her, it would be in my best interest because there's not like any overlying threat of kind of hanging around. And there's also a benefit to hanging around. We get food, we get shelter, we get to hang out with our BFF Tamar. And I think it's probably just worth it in her best interest, honestly, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, if she weighs all of her options, then yeah, she's probably going to want to stick with him. Yeah. But I mean, like, who the hell is this guy anyway? We don't know him. At a certain point, though, everybody reaches their their breaking point where they just say, you know what, this is becoming far too complicated, things just keep changing, people keep not being who they say they are, and I have been on way more ships today than I planned on being on in my whole life, and I need a vacation. So tell your client that he can go screw himself because I'm going to the spa in Novia Zem. I think Alina needs to have that moment and then she'll also do that and then come back and be like, okay, fine, I'll stay. Yeah, she storms out. She storms out. She starts packing a bag. And then when she's in the middle of packing a bag, she quietly, she starts to realize how complicated the plan is and she storms back in and she's like, okay, fine, I'm back. But not because you want me to meet this client. It's because I have decided that I want to be here because I am a strong, independent woman and I don't need to take your crap. And now she's mocking him by doing the same head back and forth thing that he does all the time because that's part of the thing now. And he's like, I don't do that. And she's like, really? I don't do that. You don't move your head like that? Hmm? He's hmm? like, I don't sound like that. And she's like, I don't sound like that. Tamar and Toya in the background are just like, mm, you kind of do that. You, mm, you might do that all the time. Mm. Yeah, Tolia's kind of tapping him on the shoulder like, um, hey, boss, um, y- y- you kind of do do that, though. And Tamar is like waiting for her brother to finish but also kind of blushing because when alina does what Sturmhan does it's um it's sort of hot yeah speaking of those two they ha i want them to have lots of sleepovers and become super badass besties i love tamar like she just keeps getting better and better and better with each like thing that we learn about her and I feel like she's becoming my favorite character, honestly. I love her and her brother equally. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting a glimpse into her first more so than her brother, but I have a feeling that'll probably change shortly. Mm. But I mean, come on. She immediately zeroes in on the fact that Mal is popular with the ladies, but oh, Alina boy. clearly is in love with him. Yes, that. And... She's a great balance between a female character who thrives in her femininity, like she mm-hmm. doesn't try to hide it and just be one of the boys, which is the direction a lot of people go in with a character like Tamar, but mm-hmm. she also doesn't let stereotypes define her. Like she is clearly a person who has had to use her feminine wiles to throw men off their guard and then turn right around and just punch him in the face. Hit him with which one of those signature no axes doubt had that coming. she has. Yeah, or like she literally cut them down to size. Yeah. I think she's just such a badass, and I love her so much. And I mean, even just like the the fact that like out of all the weapons that she can choose, like her weapons of choice are these two like really cool axes. It's like how how, how efficient do you have to be at fighting where your preferred method of fighting is with double axes? There's something about an axe. Axes are cool. They're double-sided. You get, like, the the short side and the long side, and you just chop, 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 chop. 
earlier in this chapter, Sturmhand says the Darkling is a powerful enemy, and Alina might want to think about making some powerful friends. And I'm looking at Tamar going, hello, these two are becoming best friends. Like, Tamar Mm -hmm. might even, you know what? This is going to be a hot take. Tamar might even be an upgrade from Jenya because Tamar has no motivation to double cross Alina at this point. I mean, honestly, if we're just basing people on personalities alone, I take Tamar over Jenya any day. I'm sorry. I have to agree with that. I, yeah. I my heart goes out to Jenya for what she has been through, but in a choice between who I would want as a best friend, I would t- I would choose Tamar. Tamar every time. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, one of my favorite quotes that we've gotten from her so far is when her and Alina are discussing the fact that people had to draw straws or had to be drafted into who was going to go after the sea whip, and she asked um, Tamar how they got dragged in, and she goes, "Us, we volunteered." It's just yeah. like, she is such a badass. Oh, yeah. I was just like, yes, this is great. We love her. I have determined that I do not need to censor the word badass when we say it, because the word ass is barely a cursed word. Badass? Uh, no, because uh, uh, I've, I've, I've listened to programs and I've watched programs where they censor profanities, but they leave the word badass alone. So you know what? Badass is not getting censored on this program anymore, and I don't think it's going to be a problem. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think listeners, if you find that this is a problem for you, please let us know. But otherwise, I think that that's good. Plus, we're using it in a positive manner. And I think that's part of the thing, too, is that we... When we say someone is a badass, like, that is a fabulous thing. It's not an insult or anything mean in any capacity. It just shows how just killer that person is. So I can get behind that, Jeff. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something our friend Irvin would call a sexy transition. I'm going to take us out of one chapter and into another. Because at the end of chapter 5, Alina realizes by looking at the lives of saints more closely that we are now dealing with a three amplifier situation. Not one, not two, but three. It's a magic number, apparently. Apparently. And I'm thinking, okay, come on one thing at a time you don't even have the second amplifier on yet and you're already thinking about going thirdsies give me a break yeah i feel you're like you kill yourself trying to find all these amplifiers hon never mind pulling off the epic final battle that it would probably take to put everything right i feel like that's like the person who gets like a teeny teeny tiny tattoo and then all of a sudden wants to get a full sleeve and you're like ooh, maybe not i don't know if you're ready for that level of pain quite yet So that's the end of chapter five, and this is chapter six. As if they don't have enough to worry about, Alina and Mal are coming around to the idea that not only is Ilya Morozova and Sankt Ilya the same person, but now there's a third amplifier that they will need to eventually go looking for. And once again, we are right back to this dynamic between Alina and Mal, where Alina is trying to become a crusader for the greater good, and Mal is trying to convince her to put herself first for once. They summon one of the fabricators from Sturmhan's crew, who fastens the scales from the sea whip into an amplifier bracelet for Alina, probably a lot less uncomfortable than the collar she has around her neck. When she goes to actually use her power with the second amplifier, though, it's so strong that she almost loses control and destroys everyone on the ship. But Mal helps her to calm down with one of his famous snuggly hugs, and she realizes that now she's going to have to relearn how to control her powers all over again. Again, maybe we shouldn't get all the tattoos before we actually have them on our bodies, Jeff. We don't know how much they're going to hurt. Do you know how much simpler this whole amplifier thing would be if they could just, like, take the essence of these amplifiers and turn it into markings that would go onto her body, and then the tattoos would have the power of the amplifier without her having to actually wear the thing all the time? And they would move, too. You know what that kind of reminds me of is Maui from Moana, how he has, like, the big moving tattoos and everything on him that signify the things that have happened to him. Well, he's, isn't that, isn't his moving tattoo version of himself, isn't that like a sidekick that he has? Uh, it's kind of a side character in a way. Yeah. It, it, it mostly just tells his story as a, as a demigod. Yeah, it's a tapestry on his, on his baddie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a living tapestry, essentially. 
So they have the third amplifier. It's the Firebird. And I feel as though this is the moment where Alina finally realizes like the full scope of the Darkling's plans. And it's not just, oh, I set her up with this one amplifier and we take over the world. The Darkling has thought long and hard about these plans and has a lot of research that he's put into them. And now she's fully realizing that, oh, boy. This well, is... for as long as this guy has been around, I would hope that he has really thought these things through. Because otherwise, uh, yeah. what's he been doing? Waiting for Ariana Grande to exist so that he can start the fan club? I mean, he was ready hundreds of years before she came around. Let me guess. There's a prophecy about Ariana Grande, too. Oh, you know it. You know, she's going to take over the world. She's next in line after the Sun Summoner. And Lady Gaga. Mm. I'm prepared to have that argument, but we won't do it now. I can count Lady Gaga as part of canon. She fits in. I, I think she would be on the same page as Alina, though, and not want to conform to the Darkling. I feel like Ariana Grande, too. Not conform to what the Darkling is requesting, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Maybe that's where that meat dress came from. That's a revolt against the Darkling. Because that was a wild oh, dress. Oh, you know what? I think we had just gotten to the point in history where people had forgotten about the meat dress. I remember the meat. The meat dress sticks out in my mind very, very... Like, it's one of those things that just lives rent-free in my brain for some reason, is that picture of her with the meat dress. All I remember about that dress is a bunch of jokes about skirt steak. <laughs> That's a good joke. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a good joke. Okay, as mentioned at least once on this episode already, I know we make a lot of Harry Potter comparisons, but gosh darn it, here comes another one. There is some Deathly Hallows level nonsense going on with these amplifiers, and here is exactly why. Three powerful items, which, if united, could create a power that nobody has ever wielded. Most people probably know the story, but don't believe they exist. The main protagonist of the story begins to wonder if it's their destiny to unite the three. The main villain of the story has also been looking for them for a different reason. And you have the last one. Yes, I said Alina plus Mal plus Firebird equals Harry plus Hermione plus Horcruxes. And yep. We also went on a kind of low-key camping trip. Wow, wasn't that a fun time? And Oh, yeah. <laughs> They yeah, were I... camping, looking for stuff. Yeah. Now, to be perfectly clear, I don't think anything was copied or stolen. We're not no. saying that. It's just interesting how many similarities there are. This this scenario could be categorized into this is a low-key fantasy trope that is a thing because this can't just exist in Harry Potter and in this book. This has to be a trope that's been used other times before as well, I would imagine. It's pretty specific, but I think you may be right. Yeah, I I think it's more just the fact that they're looking for items and they are discovering that there are more and more of them and the person, one villain wants them and only the good people can find them because they don't want to use them for the bad thing. That kind of shenanigans, you know? I'll tell you what. We'll put what? this to the listeners. We might get something back. We might not. But if we do, then we promise that we will read through it. And I'm sure that we will probably be thoroughly amazed. But we have noticed these similarities now between these three amplifiers and the Deathly Hallows specifically. So if anybody knows of any other fantasy series or standalone books out there that have a similar trope, of people going out looking for a trio of items to unite which will unleash untold unthought of power then please let us know because this could become a very fine essay i think and also they have to happen to be part of a children's novel that no yes, one there seems has to, be to care book. about yes yes a children's book that has clues in it that only some people have picked up on that has to be part of it exactly now, Jeff, we were already talking about the scales being infused into Alina's skin, and you uh -huh. posed a very good question about this. Yeah, I wondered about fabricators and having to make amplifiers. David made the collar that Alina has to wear, and we don't even learn the name of the fabricator from Sturmhan's crew. He just calls one of his fabricators over. They make the bracelet and then they put it on Alina so I'm wondering is 
the kind of power that goes into fashioning an amplifier, is this something that all fabricators are expected to learn how to do? I can see it being a class that they take because obviously a lot of the Grisha are after getting amplifiers, not just really powerful ones like Elena and the Darkling, but it seems to be a pretty common thing to get an amplifier, so it must be a pretty common thing to also infuse a person with an amplifier, I would imagine. Yeah. Are we making it too complicated? Maybe it's just the kind of thing where you're just basically, you don't have to do anything to the power itself. The ability of the Grisha to gel with the power of the amplifier is something that exists between them, and all you have to do is bond materials together into a thing that they can wear. Fabricators are kind of creating the super glue that is going to connect the amplifier and the Grisha together, and then once that super glue connection is connected, then the powers can kind of flow together, you know? Right. They're just they're just setting up their little Etsy shop where they're making amplifiers and mm-hmm. then charging people 50 bucks and then shipping it to them. So if, yeah. if it works when you get it, then great. If it doesn't work when you get it, then there's a no Sorry. refund policy. Yeah. I, I imagine that there are a lot of like knockoff amplifiers out there or people selling amplifiers to people who are not Grisha and being like, yeah, this will bring you Grisha power. I'll say it's kind of like the bones that we see people selling of Grisha and things like that, where they're selling just random items and saying that they are what they aren't. Yeah, it's not like buying the bones of dead saints where you feel like it's supposed to have a blessing on it. Maybe the bone belonged to a saint. Maybe it didn't. It's not that kind of thing, because with an amplifier, you would notice if you put Mm -hmm. the thing on and it doesn't amplify your power. Plus, you don't go out... And from what little actually we get about this this part of Grisha theory, you don't just go out and get an amplifier from somebody. You have to actually earn it. Like, that's part of the connection of the amplifier to your body. I feel like people who are not Grisha, though, would collect these amplifiers in the way that people, no offense to anyone, I'm not taking offense to anyone who does this, but collect crystals and just assuming that they have some kind of power built into them, which they could, I don't know, but... It's something where you're kind of just taking something on their word, someone on their word that there is something within this item. Or like if you buy like a rabbit's foot, yeah, someone's like, yeah, this is a lucky item. So and like somebody would get an amplifier because they're superstitious, not because they think it would actually work. Or it would give you as a non-Grisha power. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You buy it and then you think once you figure out how to work it, then you can have Grisha power too. Yeah, and it's just broken. It's not, it's not, it's, well, it's not broken. It's you. You're just not connecting with it correctly. That's what they tell you when you write to the people who sold it to you. But Alina gels with her second amplifier immediately and then almost microwaves everybody on the ship and turns them into exploded pizza pockets (laughs) until Mal gives her a cuddly hug and makes it all better. I feel like that's the only thing he's good for is being a wall and being a pillow. I kind of think of him as a wall with arms. <laughs> you could have said a pillow with arms. You just said wall. No, he's a wall with arms. He's going to protect her. And then while he's protecting her, he's going to give her a hug. And that's all that's happening. Walls don't have brains and neither does Mal. And you know what? It's still a, pur- a purpose is a purpose. If his purpose is to be here and be a pillow wall with arms or whatever the hell it is, <laughs> and keep Alina from turning everybody on the ship into exploded pizza pockets, then I think everybody who reaches their destination safely on Sturmhound's ship is going to say, thank you, Mal. Thank you for doing the one simple thing that we needed in order to remain alive. You know what? In this this situation, it's fine. It's fine. It's It's fine. It's fine. And nothing is ever going to happen to change, and that's as good as it's going to get, and it's fine, and Mal is fine, and no. everybody's fine. No. I'm going to just agree with you on that one, Jeff, and we'll talk more about Mal when we get into later chapters, because he hasn't really, like, ooh, like, ticked that box of hatred quite yet, but he's, he's, he's like... He's building up momentum right now. He's like, ah. It's teetering there in this chapter because, again, they're having the... 
it's it's so funny that this is the thing that's bringing that back up again. It's not people being jealous. It's not people thinking that people don't care about them when in fact they care more about each other than anybody else in the world. It's the fact that he wants Alina to put herself before other people and she's mad because he doesn't understand the relevance of her position and how she can't just walk away from it because of what the world would turn into if she did. He doesn't get that. Yeah. He can't possibly get that. Call me crazy, Jeff, but this whole scene where Alina's like pressure cooking the ship, like it feels like it's written like weirdly. I, I like I I couldn't get this out of my head. While I was reading it like she's like almost having like an orgasm. Like it just feels like it's just like I don't know. I read through it and I was like, wow, this feels oddly sexual to me. I could be the only one standing on this hill, but I was like, wow. I think at first it might have, but then it very quickly turned into, oh, this doesn't act. It's like when you're scratching an itch and it feels really, really good, but then you hit that point where you're like, oh, nope, scratched too hard. Except it's like a million times that because scratching yourself doesn't turn other people into exploded pizza pockets on your ship. Mm, but it's kind of like that because at first it feels really, really good, but then it starts to feel slightly less good and more painful when you realize that this isn't just hitting a sweet spot. This is actually more power than your body is physically able to endure. I don't know. I still think it sounded really, it was really sexual to me. I was like, <sighs> I mean, ah, maybe. <sighs> ah. I don't know. Listeners, hit me up in my DMs if you thought this was a, this this scene so, felt oddly sexual to me. You don't have to share it on the show, but like, I would just like to know that I'm not the only one who thought that. Yeah, and you know what? I'm not going to say no. I'm just going to say sure. Okay, Jeff. Okay. I think we can end this chapter with just an appreciation for Sturmhand and how. Yes quippy and fabulous he is oh i love him yeah i just want him to i want him to be in every conversation just because like sometimes when mal talks if he talks too long it's aggravating mm -hmm. every time the apparat talks it oh, makes God. my skin crawl and when the darkling talks it makes me feel uncomfortable because I like the way he's saying it, but I hate what he is saying. Yeah. But with Sturmhand, everything is quippy and fun, and even the stuff that doesn't necessarily hit the right way at first, you think about it and you realize, well, he's right. Yeah. That just brings an even greater appreciation for Lee as an author, too. The fact that she's able to write all these different characters and evoke such strong emotions from us with her being the sole writer of these books and just portraying these characters so well. Yeah, their personalities are very different, but very strong. Yeah, it's just a good testament to her writing. And I think, Jeff, we can leave the listeners with this chapter of this shit. We can leave the listeners at the end of this chapter with some advice to go out into the world with, which is anything worth doing is always a bad idea, Jeff. Oh, I'm, that's a tattoo. Yeah. Well, those were even the shorter chapter. There was plenty in there to think about. But why don't we transition to something a little bit more festive? What do you say? Ooh, yeah. Let's do let's do our fun segment. What are we What are we gonna do? Oh well, this week, Jeff, I have some Mad Libs for you. Really? Yes, I have. So I have done what you did before, is that I pulled a section of the book that we've already read, and I have some words that I would like to get from you, and then we'll read through it. So listeners, this is a passage from the book that we've already read, and we're going to hear the revised version via Jeff. Oh, awesome. I thought for sure when you said Mad Libs that you were going to give me another Mad Lib from that Camp Rock book that you had. I don't, I got lost in the mail, so I don't have it. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so Mad Lib from the book. Hit me. Okay, I need a verb. Sale. Oh, sorry. Oh, it was a noun. Sorry, I wrote, I wrote by my... But that's okay. Sale works for that, too. We can use that. Okay, give me another noun. Ariana Grande coffee maker. Okay. I need a verb in the past tense. Um... Bobbled. I need another noun. 
Etsy shop. Sure. I need a verb. Lick. I need a noun. Cheeseburger. And then I'm going to need a body part. Uvula. Trying sure. to think of words that would be. I'm trying to think of words that either based on the context could be hilarious or words that just sound fun. Okay. I mean, I'm behind that 100%. And then I need two more nouns. Okay. Let's see. Um, Brillo pad. Sure. Just because I can hear my wife in the other room doing dishes. Uh huh. And let's see. Something Grisha verse related that's funny. Um, Tamar's axe. Okay. And then I'm going to need a person. Mm, Sturm hound. And then I need a verb. Mm, stretch. Noun. Energy drink. Because <laughs> I'm looking on my desk and I see one. And then I'm going to need a number. 73. And then I'm going to need an, another two more nouns. Greeting card. And personal massager. And then I'm going to need a verb. Shout. Bout. Shout. Oh, shout. Yes, you know, you make me want to shout. Shout, them my hands up and and shout, shout, them and shout. shout. Only shout. word I know is shout. shout. Come on now. Okay, and then lastly, I need a number. Eleven. Okay, so this is a passage from page 52 of the book. It is a conversation between Alina and the Darkling about what has happened and how Alina has tried to kill the Darkling. So here we go. <clears throat> how did you survive? He ran his hand over the sharp line of his sail. It seems the Volker did not care for the taste of my Ariana Grande coffee maker. Almost yes! idly. <laughs> he said almost <laughs> idly. <laughs> Have you ever bobbled that they do not feed on Etsy shops? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's licked. They were his creations, just like the thing they had buried in the, they had buried. It's cheeseburger. Oh, sorry. Starting over. It's licked. They were his creations, just like the thing that had buried its cheeseburger in my uvula. The skin <laughs> there there still pulsed. The skin there still pulsed. What did I write here? Oh, sorry. Brillo card. Brillo pad calls to Tamar's axe. <laughs> It was not an experience I care to repeat. I've had my fill of the Sturmhahn and yours. I crossed the room, coming to stretch before the energy drink. Then why give me a 73rd amplifier? I asked desperately, gasping for the greeting card that would somehow make him see my personal massager. <laughs> In case you've forgotten, I tried to shout you and failed. Here's to 11th chances. I think the best part okay. is he did not care for the taste of my Ariana Grande curing. Oh my god, that could not have worked out any better. I didn't know what this passage was, but I just I had a feeling now that we've now that we have established a headcanon that the Darkling has a signature customized Ariana Grande coffee maker that this has to feature somewhere in this Mad Lib. It, it is here, and it actually went into a good spot. I would say. Uh, it couldn't have worked out any better. I also, for some reason, I, I like the part about uh, sticking a cheeseburger in your uvula because that's not quite how eating works, but it's not not how it works. They were his creations, just like the thing that had buried its cheeseburger in my uvula. <laughs> I mean, that's a sen That's like the kind of <laughs> sentence. You know what? That sentence. I'll I'll tell you the real reason that sentence makes me laugh is because that sounds like the kind of thing where if I'm talking to my wife. And it feels like she's distracted by like TikTok on her phone or, or something. Then I'll suddenly start saying nonsense sentences like that. <laughs> like I'll be talking about my day. Like I was trying to get these boxes off of the line. And then suddenly the boxes all came to life and they started dancing a <laughs> chorus line while also putting cheeseburgers in their uvulas. And suddenly I turned into a giant loaf of pumpernickel bread and we were acting out the plot of the birdcage. It was fantastic. And then she'll look up and say, wait, what? And I'll say, oh, okay, you did hear me. You're actually paying attention. 
Yeah, I don't just say like, hey, hey, I'm talking to you. Pay attention to me. Like, I start saying nonsense until they call me on it. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. You can hear me. Excellent. Well, here's to 11th chances on that, Jeff. 11th ch- I love that. That that was a that was a very fine Mad Lib. Thank you for that. Yes. I, I have determined, though, that next time I need to make my spots where I write things in a little bit bigger. I just took the page and I copied it, but there wasn't enough space for me to write an Ariana Grande okay. coffee maker. I see. When you said that, I was wondering how, how you had actually set that up, and I was thinking, okay, so that's that's that makes sense. So let's head on over into our question of the week, which we already answered last week's question in our Voice of the People. So Jeff, what is our question for this coming week? We were talking about earlier how Tamar would probably, for us at least, make a better BFF than Jenya for Alina. So we want to know how other people feel about that. Which of these two characters would you rather have as your BFF? Would you rather hang out with Jenya, or would you rather hang out with Tamar? If you have any strong opinions, or even any middle-of-the-road opinions, whatever you think about this question, we would love to hear it. You can DM us on any of our social medias, or you can send us an email if you have a slightly longer thought, and tell us what you think. And that wraps up our episode for the week, Jeff. So, listeners, thank you so much for listening, and on our next episode, we will be discussing discussing chapters 7 and 8 of Siege and Storm, so if you'd like to go ahead and get a head start on reading those, please do so. And if you'd like to listen to any of our past episodes or just give this episode a re-listen, you can listen to us on any platform where pods are cast. And you can also listen to our episodes on YouTube. And if you want to join in on our incredible community of listeners giving us feedback and just having a good time on Twitter and Instagram, you can find us at Into the Fold Pod. And if you have any long form answers, or if you'd love to send us that picture of Canadian pa- Peyton, Can- pa- yeah. and if you have any long form answers, or if Canadian Peyton wants to send us that picture of, of themselves with their face on the pictures of Canadian bacon, you can send that to into the full pod at gmail.com. And if you would like to do us a great kindness by rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, we love to look at the reviews and we love to share them here on the show so that we can let everybody else know how much you're enjoying it. And the best way that you can share our podcast with other people is by word of mouth and personal recommendation. So thank you to anyone who has done that so far. And Thank you to anyone who is helping us grow our little community as we go forward. And until next time. This is the part where I see you in the hole. Recording, 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 recording. That could be our new theme song. If we ever get tired of the old one, I like our theme song, but if we ever, hey, if we ever need another one, that could be our theme song. What are the words again? Recording, 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 recording. It's catchy. I like it. I asked it Canadian Peyton. It made, when I looked at the, yeah. To make up, <laughs> she asked, he, they have to put their face on the, the bacon. That was like weirdly just like, hello. I was trying to do a thing. I was like, hello. It, yeah. I, you kind of got there like halfway. Like Trelawney coming out of the shadows. Hello. Good day, my dear. Good day, my dears. The Grim is coming for you. It will <coughs> happen tonight. <gasps> Reunited once more. <gasps> And then we get Bem in the corner, just giving us, like, hot takes on how dark and crazy everything is. I love Bem. Bem is great. I was thinking of turning that into a moment where I, like, redact everything but the uh, prepositions. Like, it's not like, and his, because he's, like, I thought about doing it that way, but, oh, wait, we should do that together. Okay. One, One, two, two, three. Scandalous!
I feel like Cute. we did not do that similarly at all. And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three. Scandalous! There, there we go. go. That was good. That's better. Okay. So, you know what I just realized, Jeff? What? We're, we're not recording the Zoom calls. You want to start recording the Zoom call? Oh, yeah. I'll I'll. So we at least have from that. here on. He just kind of... Ref- oh i'm sorry she hasn't done it yet never mind you are skipping ahead my friend i am skipping ahead sorry let's sexually transcend <laughs> sexually let's sexually Se- transmit let's nothing sexually transmit our for let's our listeners not. into the next <laughs> let's no i don't think we should do that <laughs> right all wonder good sentence that was great see told you bad at sports strike one I love to yacht, I live to yacht, my yacht is hot, I yacht a lot. Are you a thought on a yacht? Uh, no. I, I thought I not. A... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was jolly good. Jolly good. 